What is up, everybody? Mr. Purse here. Welcome to Unit 1, Part 1 on Technological and Environmental Transformations. This is basically is the start of human beings all the way through 600 BCE. A lot of stuff happened in this time period. But here's the deal. Before we get started, just a couple things. As you're watching these videos, this one today and the last one you'll watch in April, please make sure you're taking notes on all this stuff because what's going to happen is you're going to get a review sheet, you're going to get at the end of this unit, and you're going to want to be able to have access to the notes without having to rewatch me say all this stuff over again. So please take notes. Please make sure you're not doing it on the car ride to school um, when you're not going to have the ability to take notes. So please take notes on this. Also, you have the ability to pause this. You have the ability to rewind it. So if I'm talking too fast, if you don't get notes, if I skip ahead on a slide too fast, you can always pause it and go back. So that's that. So a couple things before we get into this unit and this, into this time period, just a couple, one quick overview. If you didn't learn this last year, AP World History is broken up into six time periods or six units. The first unit that we're going to do, which is the shortest unit, is unit one, which is 8000 BCE to 600 BCE, which you did last year. So it's just a review of some stuff that we did last year. And it's only 5% of the AP World exam. So it's the smallest unit. This is one we'll spend the least amount of time on. Also, what you did last year is Unit 2, which is 600 BC to 600 CE. And if you don't know BCE, it means Before Common Era, and CE means Common Era. They kind of changed historically that BC and AD that you might have grown up seeing. So it's 600 BCE to 600 CE. That's 15% of the exam. That's the classical civilizations, Han, Gupta, Roman, Greek. Then you got 600 to 1450, which is Unit 3, 20%, 1450 to 1750, which is unit four, 20%. This is pretty much where you left off last year in global one or AP nine, which is the age of exploration. That's this time period. And then we got 1750 to 1900, which is unit five, 20%, and then 1900 to present, which is also 20%. If you add all those up, it's 100% of the exam. We will spend the least amount of time on units one, two, and three, because a lot of that's review from last year. So consider this a little bit of review and away we go. So first thing to point out is, one of the main themes here is what's called big geography. It's looking at the entire world and how people migrated around that, around the earth. So the earliest evidence of human beings existing is here, just south of the Sahara Desert, known as Sub-Saharan Africa, here in the region that's now known as Ethiopia, where we've discovered the earliest remnants or bone fragments of human beings. And you can see about 100,000 years ago, People migrated out of this area, and what we found from archaeological evidence is that human beings migrated into this region right here, which is known as Mesopotamia, and then over into this region into Europe, and then through these areas you can kind of see, and then of course across the Bering Strait, which you probably learned about in like third grade, into the Americas, as well as into the Pacific. So this is kind of the spreading out of people, which hopefully you learned about last year. As people traveled they learned to adapt to their environment so the tools that you're going to see in the andes mountains in south america are going to be similar to a certain degree to the tools you see in east asia versus europe versus africa but they're going to adapt to their environment so stone tools are going to be different depending upon what region you're in so a region that um maybe in sub-Saharan Africa doesn't have the same access to materials as in Europe. So they're going to be different materials and different stone tools. Also, human beings are going to have access to fire. This is huge. You got to have fire. You need fire to cook. You need fire to keep uh, animals away at night. So around your camp, you need fire to keep warm in the wintertime. So the idea of being able to create and control fire is huge and a monumental event in human history as people kind of discover how to do this. Also, these people who we're going to see um, are really going to be nomadic, which hopefully you know is moving from place to place, and they don't move place to place daily. It's usually, at least the archaeological evidence shows that they kind of move place to place seasonally. And they're going to be in small structured bands, meaning like 40 or so people, 20, 40 people, and the men are going to be hunters and the women are going to be gatherers. And this is what a fancy word called egalitarianism, meaning that the men who hunt and the women who gather are really seen as equals. They're not seen as one is better than the other or one job is more important than the other. Both jobs are vital to the success of the bands. You need the women who know what berries to eat and which ones are poisonous. And you need men who are able to go out and hunt successfully animals that can be brought back and skinned for um 
for clothing and for the tents, as well as um, obviously the meat to eat and the bones for um, tools. So all these things are important. So they're, as these bands move, so band one comes here, hey, what's up, band one? And band two comes here, what's up? And as we meet, we might exchange ideas. We might exchange goods. We might be like, hey, yo, I saw that uh, river back there. If you're looking for somewhere or whatever. So they're going to exchange ideas and goods as they move along. With this comes the Neolithic Revolution and what is known as the Early Agricultural Society. So around 8000 BCE, which is the end of the last ice age, people somehow, some way, and it was probably from a woman because women were the gatherers, realized that by planting seeds in the ground, things grew. And people started saying, hey, let's plant seeds here. And we don't know exactly how it happened, but again, most likely it was a woman who was a gatherer who realized this. And they realized that if you plant stuff, things can grow. And this leads to what you all should have learned last year, which is the Neolithic Revolution. And it leads to more complex societies because now we have plant sources that we can rely on. And when we rely on them, we can remain in one place. And also we can gather, we can make more food than just what we need. And therefore we can spread that food out to other people who now don't have to be hunters and gatherers. They can be warrior class or they can be artisans or they can do other jobs that aren't necessarily hunting, gathering, or now with the Neolithic Revolution, farming. With this comes as well the domestication of plants and animals. To domesticate something is to be able to essentially control it. I have a dog. My dog, her ancestors years and years ago were not dogs that would live in the house and kind of wander around and look for, you know, sniff my leg or whatever the dog, whatever your dog does. Those were wild wolves. At some point, as human beings settled, they began to domesticate these animals to make it so that the wolf, which would bite you and kill you, now my dog is pretty docile and, and chill for the most part. Also, just with domestication, just like to show you the difference here, this is a banana pre-domestication, all right? What we've done is by crossbreeding and cross-pollination and a lot of biological stuff that goes way beyond my history mind, human beings made this. So we've changed or manipulated through domestication. This is what corn looked like back prior before the Neolithic Revolution and before the corn was domesticated. This is what watermelon looked like. And you can see things, even this, the natural peach. This is a peach from 4000 BCE and it was about 25 mill millimeters, very, very small. Um, and it wasn't as edible as the peaches that you have today. Also, these agricultural societies are going to focus on farming. They're going to be agrarian. That's just a fancy word for farming. Agrarian, this term right here, farming, agrarian farming, agrarian farming. And occasionally, these agricultural societies that are going to set up near water. Why water? Because you need to be able to have a water supply to drink from, to bathe in, and obviously to support your crops. So these two different groups are going to occasionally interact. Um, so one agricultural society is going to meet another one. Hey, what's up? Oh, that's a cool thing. Let me get some of those seeds. And then they might plant them somewhere else, whether it's grain, whether it's wheat. Um, while these agricultural societies are forming, there are groups of people who are obviously still nomadic. Not everyone switches to farming like that. Over the course of the world, it's a transition of 5,000 years. And still to this day, people are still nomadic. But also some groups of people are going to be called pastoralists. These are people who are herders. They herd animals. They travel all around, whether it's with sheep or with goats, and they literally wander with their goats and sheep. These people, these pastoralists, are going to be the people who are going to transfer knowledge. They are going to go to one agricultural society and meet them and be like, hey, what's up? Blah, 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 blah. And then they go to another agricultural society because they're traveling, because they have all these animals, and they say, hey, look, those guys back there in blah, blah, blah town had this idea. Let me let you know about it. So these pastoralists are going to be huge disseminators. Great word, by the way, disseminate to spread out information. Last but not least, not everything is great. The Neolithic Revolution isn't like, whoa, this is 100% amazing. There are issues with these. Well, first of all, let's do the positives because who doesn't want to do the good news first? So here's the good news about Neolithic Revolution. You have a reliable source of food. Yay, giddy up, reliable source of food. Two, you have an increase in population. Probably a good thing until we overpopulate the world and we have 7 billion people now. Another story for another day. You have specialization of labor. Not everyone has to be a hunter and gatherer like nomadic times. Not everyone has to be a farmer like at the start of the Neolithic Revolution. We have people who can do different 
things, which also leads to a new different labor. So people can now focus on being scribes or focus on essentially what we call modern day like engineering, building stuff. Also, we have technological improvements in agriculture, trade, transportation, like the wheel. The wheel would not have been invented unless someone had time to figure out how to make a wheel. That's good stuff. Yay, now you need the revolution. There's some bad stuff though too. We have a whole bunch of environmental changes. We are manipulating the environment to grow crops. We need animals who are domesticated now to graze. We have water systems that need to be created, whether it's eventually what we see is irrigation systems in the river valley civilizations. We also see an increase in population, which is good, but it's also bad because populations need food. If your town, West Hampton Beach, has a lot of food, and I'm in Massapequa right now, and in Massapequa, we don't have a lot of food, but we know you people in West Hampton Beach have a ton of food. What are we going to do? We might go to war with you because our population is growing and we are hungry. So we bring all of our soldiers or our warriors because we have a specialization of labor now and we come and invade you. Not necessarily a good thing compared to our hunting and gathering days. Also, we see patriarchal social structures. Patriarchal, if you have trouble with this word, patriarchy, think of pa, male. So patriarchal is male dominated. If it's matriarchal, ma, mama, mommy, um, it would be, a female dominated society. But in this case, many of these Neolithic societies become patriarchal and they become male dominated because the men are going to be the warriors. They are going to go off and fight and they are going to come back and be considered heroes. And eventually the warriors become the kings and the leaders in the government structure. So here's the deal. That's what I got for unit one. Next up, next video, next time, we'll do the start of civilization. Specifically, we'll focus on Egypt and Mesopotamia, but we'll do a little round the world type thing. Um, and we'll wrap up unit one. Hopefully you knew most of this stuff, but if you didn't, now you learned something. As always, make sure you take notes. And if you have any questions, write them down. Let me know. That's all I got. Have a good day.